Now, we have a section on this show called Wackademia, about the wacky world of academia, and it's a lot of fun, but it's also extremely concerning. Here's a clip from a graduation ceremony at the Northeastern University in Boston. Boston is, of course, woke central. The speaker is the visiting deputy prime minister of Canada. Ooh, alarm bells should be ringing already pretty loudly. But even armed with that warning, you won't be prepared for the nonsense that is spouted. It is so riddled with stupidity, lack of reason, illogical conclusions, and outright misinformation that it is impossible to ignore. But first, here's her setup. Our time of tranquility is over, and we are living in an age of change. We're living through what President Biden, on a visit to my country in March, called an inflection point. A time of transformation, he said, that comes once every five or six generations. Now, like it or not, you are graduating into that inflection point. And as some of the very best educated people on our planet, you have the rare and precious opportunity to shape it. Okay, so far that's kind of reasonable. These kids are our brightest and best, etc. yada, yada. I'm not quite sure what this every fifth or sixth generation inflection point refers to. World War II, no, that's only three, maybe four generations. World War I, maybe. The Industrial Revolution, perhaps. I think we might be getting warm, if you'll forgive the pun. So what is this inflection point? What is this upheaval which is going to the roots of humanity itself? There are many ways to describe this transformational moment, but I think they all come down to one fundamental question. Aha, uh -huh. okay, now we're getting there. One fundamental question, I like it. Well, I can think of a few fundamental questions such as, how do we peacefully suppress the rise of China to ensure it maintains its wealth and social cohesion without resorting to war? That would be one pretty important question for these kids. Or how about, how do we retain our individual democratic rights and freedoms in an era where technological progress allows the state and bureaucracies and corporations to seize control of most of those fundamental rights and remove them from us at the push of a button. I think that might be another important question for these kids at their inflection point. Or perhaps, given we are talking to bright students after all, how about how, in an era of information overload, do we ensure that the key lessons of our civilization, as crystallized in the Enlightenment, retain their dominance? Or perhaps I might even ask, in an era of global migration, how do we promote harmony between the races rather than promote division? So there's a few questions from me that the kids might choose to answer, but let's see what the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada believes is the fundamental question America's brightest and most privileged students have the rare and precious opportunity to shape. Does capitalist democracy still work? Does capitalist democracy still work? Sorry, what? In the entire history of civilization, there has never been a system of governance that has delivered peace and prosperity on a greater scale than capitalist democracy around the planet, especially in the last three generations. So which part of capitalist democracy does this woman have a problem with? The capitalist bit or the democratic bit, or both? That's the question being posed around kitchen tables in my country and this one, as parents wonder if our children can count on capitalist democracy's essential promise of a future more prosperous than our present. Whoa, 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 steady on here. Kitchen tables? 
The last Sheila I heard banging on about kitchen tables was our very own Gillian Triggs, Human Rights Commissioner. That's her on the right. She used to rock around in one of those floppy black hats as well. <laughs> Maybe it's catching. <laughs> Quote, sadly, you can say what you like around the kitchen table. That was one of Gillian's uh, famous quotations. So apparently the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada has also been snooping around kitchen table conversations. Otherwise, how would she know what people are talking about? Or, actually, I think this is more likely, did she just make that last bit up? You know, I don't actually think Canadians are sitting around kitchen tables going, pass the maple syrup, hon. Oh, and kids, by the way, do you think capitalist democracy still works? They're more likely to be sitting around the kitchen table saying things like, what our left-wing government did to the convoy of truckers last year was an absolute disgrace. Or perhaps the kids might be saying something like, hey, mum, have you ever noticed how much Justin Trudeau looks just like the spitting image of the brutal <laughs> communist dictator Fidel Castro? <laughs> Why is that, mum? <laughs> but I digress. Let's go back to today's essential <sighs> question. It is the question being posed in the muddy and bloodied trenches of Bakhmut as Ukraine's brave Democrats resist the invading forces of Putin's dictatorship. Huh? What? What? OK, we've gone from the kitchen table to the muddy trenches of Bakhmut. OK, that's a bit of a non sequitur, but uh, you can look that up, kids. You won't learn it at school. But anyway, <laughs> I don't think the Ukrainians are really asking themselves if capitalist democracy works. I think they're asking themselves if the West is actually going to help them being overrun and help them defeat Putin's murderous communist thugs. But anyway, does all this actually have a point? Where is it all leading to? And it is the question being posed by our shrinking glaciers and our warming oceans, which are asking us, wordlessly but emphatically, if democratic societies can rise to the existential challenge of climate change. Ah, uh, of course. Let's ask the glaciers. That's what I've always said. Let's ask the coral in the Great Barrier Reef. Let's ask the sinking <laughs> islands. Let's ask the wildfires. You may not get an answer, but they're all silently posing the question, does capital democracy work? Except, of course, they're not posing that question, and it is verging on the imbecilic to say that they are. If you seriously believe that carbon dioxide emissions are having a severe and extreme effect on the planet, then you should be aware, as the UK Telegraph pointed out last year, and I quote, China pumped out more pollution in eight years than the entire United Kingdom has pumped out since the Industrial Revolution. Yes, China's CO2 emissions of 80 billion tonnes between 2013 and 2020 is higher than Britain's 78 billion tonnes over the last 220 years. The one system of governance that is already producing and will carry on well into the foreseeable future, producing the largest amount of carbon dioxide emissions, is the centrally controlled communist government of China run by a totalitarian communist dictator. Capitalism means economic freedom, free of centralised control. Democracy means freedom to choose how we are ruled. Destroy either of those two precious freedoms, or worse, destroy them both, and you are condemning us all to live under tyranny and oppression. The real danger being done to our youth is not only terrorising them with extremist doomsday predictions about climate change, but then compounding that falsehood by claiming that capitalist democracy, the great saviour of civilization, is somehow to blame or is incapable of dealing with the perceived problem and, and insisting that they should be exploring our brightest and our best should be exploring alternatives. Yes, we are at an inflection point, but it is the opposite of what the left 
here and elsewhere are telling us. The inflection point is very simple. We are sacrificing our common sense and our democratic norms to an elite group who are using all the levers at their disposal, as they themselves boast, to try and bring in the opposite to capitalist democracy, a collectivist, globalist, centrally controlled economy in order to combat climate change. Indeed, within the Biden administration, the focus is all on the so-called climate emergency, with the entire economy being put at risk. Stop these disasters from getting even worse. We have to cut the carbon pollution that's driving the climate crisis. And that's what the Inflation Reduction Act is all about. Uh, as Kareen noted, we're marking the one year anniversary of a truly transformative piece of legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the largest investment in clean energy and climate action ever in the United States, in the history of the world. Inflation, inflation reduction, now give me a break. That's all Wellian nonsense. There are those who fear that we will soon be seeing measures put in place, such as lockdowns or the enforced closing of businesses. We've already seen the closing of farms, stealing of land, etc., around the world. Lockdowns similar to COVID, but in the name of climate. According to theblaze.com website, Democrat Senator Edward Markey. Sounds like malarkey. <laughs> Edward Markey from Massachusetts, one of the authors of the original Green New Deal resolution, said in a statement to Politico, quote, the devastation in Maui is a clear sign that the president must declare a climate emergency now. His fellow Democrat from Oregon, Earl Blumenauer, echoed the cry, saying, quote, President Biden needs to declare a national climate emergency to unlock vast federal resources. Well, I hate to tell you, there's none left. And emergency powers to help our communities prepare for and recover from these deadly climate disasters. I only shudder to think what those emergency powers would or will entail. A dramatic reduction in meat and dairy, less energy consumption per person, low emission zones like we see in the UK, less flying, apart from the elites, of course, who've got their private jets to whiz around. And these and many other measures are high on the list of ambitions for climate zealots and global warming authoritarians around the world. I doubt capitalism or democracy are very high on their menu.